Hello everyone and thank you very much for the keynote invitation. I'm very glad to be presenting at the second international conference on materials chemistry and environmental engineering. My name is Anthony Di Chiara. I am a warehouser endowed associate professor in bioresource science and engineering at the University of Washington in Seattle. And today I'm going to be talking about our recent advances toward the development of cellulose based materials for multifunctional liquid sensing applications. The motivations for this research are twofold. First, one important aspect of addressing the global water challenge consists of the development of new technologies to prevent leaky pipes and wasteful irrigations, which are actually among the main contributors to water scarcity on the planet. The American Society of Civil Engineers actually indicates that a water break occurs every two minutes in the United States alone which is enough to fill over 9,000 swimming pools every single day. And the most important here is that we are actually talking about clean and treated water. Now, more globally, the World Bank estimates that global non-revenue water, which actually refers to the cost of water lost to leaks, approaches $14 billion. And the current technology used against leaks mostly relies on flow rate monitoring, which is not ideal to locate accurately a leak in a very large and complex piping system. And other resistive sensors that would allow them to do such a thing are typically have underwhelming performance, like low sensitivity or very long response time, for example. And this is because making a, a water sensor is actually very challenging because you need a material that is stable in water such that uh, it's not going to be easily dissolved and damaged uh, uh, when it contact with water uh, but on the other hand most materials that are stable in water are non-polar material and they don't have a good affinity for water which will basically yield uh, underwhelming sensing performances so the uh, idea that we have here is to use cellulose. So cellulose is uh, one of the most abundant biopolymer on Earth, and it has the unique ability to uh, reversibly swell and shrink as it gets wet and dry over and over. So in this research, we've exploited this uh, property by grafting electrically conductive nanoparticles on the surface of cellulose fibers. This way, sort of a breezing motion of cellulose fibers, uh, which is induced by the variations in the moisture content, can be rapidly and precisely captured through changes in the electrical resistance of the material. As the embedded nanoparticles draw closer or further away from each other, um, the electrical connections will be either formed or disrupted. And this mechanism is not only limited to water, it could be extended easily to other types of solvents. But today, I'm going to focus mostly on uh, aqueous phase uh, sensing. So, our proposed solution is uh, first uh, to convert biomass into nanocellulose and use nanocellulose as one of the um, main uh, swellable material for uh, initiating the sensing uh, mechanism here. But the issue of nanocellulose is that it has a very large surface area and is very hygroscopic. So if we were to make a microscopic material you know, for human scale technology, it would be very hard and it would take a long time. That's not scalable. Uh, because imagine making a nanocellulose film, uh, you'll need to remove the water uh, from the nanocellulose solution and it will be hard to drain because of the hygroscopic nature and the large surface area of nanocellulose. So the idea that we propose here is to actually mix the nanocellulose with regular pulp fibers to make uh, sort of a paper nanocomposite. And in order to impart electrical conductivity to this paper, we will be using uh, carbon-based uh, nanofillers, in this case, carbon nanotubes, uh, multiple carbon nanotubes. So uh, the issue is that the carbon nanotubes are not compatible with uh, the polar uh, cellulose fibers. So we'll have to design a certain type of nanocellulose to first help disperse the carbon nanotubes in water, and then second, uh, those nanocellulose will also help us to breach the carbon nanotubes onto the surface of the pulp fibers and to make um, the, the, the final paper nanocomposite. So this talk will be um, um, 
will be break up into uh, four different sections. First, I'll talk about the synthesis of the nanocellulose. Then I'll move on to the hybridization between the nanocellulose and the carbon nanotubes. And then I will talk about the uh, pilot scale production of that paper nanocomposite. And finally, I'll finish about talking on the multifunctional uh, app liquid sensing applications of this material. So, moving on to the uh, synthesis of nanocellulose, uh, here we start with uh, bleach softwood pulp, and we use a well-established tempo oxidation process, followed by mechanical defibrillation, to extract uh, cellulose nanofibrils from this uh, biomass. So, the tempo oxidation process, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk in detail about this, uh, it's well established in the literature. Um, but one thing to note here is that under those conditions here, which are pretty typical uh, for nanocellulose production, uh, we could actually tweak uh, and tune the properties of the nanocellulose simply by changing the oxidation time, as you can see in this picture here. Um, so uh, when we change the oxidation time from a few minutes to up to three hours, uh, not only we can change the diameter and the lengths of the cellulose nanofibrils, but most importantly, we can change their charge density, basically their surface chemistry. And so when we characterize further those uh, cellulose nanofibrils, we can see that the one we actually used in this work, um, they have a morphology of about 1 to 3 nanometer in width and then about 500 nanometer in length. And conductometric titration um, also uh, showed us uh, that uh, the uh, carboxylic groups are present on the surface, and then to a lesser extent, some aldehyde groups are also present on the surface, which will be very important to actually interact with um, the carbon nanotubes and, and, um, and help disperse them in water. So moving on to the hybridization between the nanocellulose and the carbon nanotubes. So first, a word on the type of carbon nanotubes we use. There are actually industrial grade carbon nanotubes functionalized with uh, carboxylic uh, acid groups. Uh, the purity is not great, uh, and uh, the cost of those nanotubes is about $350 per kilogram. And so here, uh, we've mixed uh, the carbon nanotubes and cellulose uh, in water using a double acoustic um, irradiation system, so basically a double sonication system. This allows us to reduce the sonication uh, energy, um, and so we can have a lesser damage this way that are being extended to uh, the nanoparticles. And so what we can see here is when we compare the nanocellulose against a typical surfactant used to disperse carbon nanotubes in water, the nanocellulose is actually a little bit better at individualizing and stabilizing uh, the colloidal carbon nanotubes in, in water. So now we can actually use this mixture for uh, making a paper. And so before making paper, I want to talk a little bit more about the interactions uh, between the nanocellulose and carbon nanotubes. So to investigate those interactions, those interfacial interactions further, we actually use the PIFM, which is a combination of an atomic force microscope with infrared spectroscopy. So here you can see that with the atomic force microscope, uh, we can see and follow a single, uh, sorry, a carbon nanotube. And this carbon nanotube uh, will have a different locations along its lengths will have interactions uh, with and without, uh, you know, nanocellulose. And so when we take uh, FTIR spectra at those different locations here, um, we know that at some of those locations uh, around uh, location number one will not, will, will not have contact with the nanocellulose. And then as we move further, we'll have, uh, we start to see a contact with, between the nanocellulose and the nanotubes. And so here, in changing the spectra, mostly in those three regions indicating here, um, actually um, showed us that uh, there are uh, you know, strong interactions uh, between the nanotubes and the nanocellulose, and mostly indicating aromatic uh, type interactions. And then also when we look at the transmission electron microscope here, those white arrows indicate uh, locations where nanocellulose is wrapping around uh, the carbon nanotubes. So we have good interactions between the nanotubes and the nanocellulose. So now when we use this mixture to make paper uh, here, we actually have a pallet scale paper machine that you can see here is operated at about four meters a minute. Um, and we, uh, when we use uh, this uh, nanofiller 
as a reinforcing agent to the paper, we have very good retention because of the presence of the nanocellulose. And so when we can see that uh, on the SEM picture, uh, there is a good distribution of nano uh, fillers or nan carbon nanotubes in the paper. Uh, and when we look really closely, so here at the low scale magnification, we don't really see any aggregates. And when we look closely, we can see that uh, nanoparticles are actually um, you know, bridging and spinning between two pulp fibers, creating those um, electrical connections I was talking about earlier. Now, uh, what happens when we do the same experiment, but in the absence of nanocellulose, well, first, we're losing a lot of carbon nanotubes uh, because uh, they're not, uh, you know, there's no uh, good um, interaction between the nanotubes alone and the pulp fibers, so there's lots of losses. And then second, the nanotubes will tend to aggregate in water, uh, which forms those aggregates here, and this translates to a very large distribution in electrical conductivity or resistance in the final paper. So the presence of nanocellulose not only allows us to reduce significantly the loss of carbon nanotubes in the paper making process, but also it makes the material much more uniform, uh, as you can see here in terms of electrical properties. So um, the uh, resulting paper is very flexible, as you can see in the uh, top right corner picture. And then the grammage of the paper that we uh, made in this case is 80 gram per meter square, which is comparable to most uh, copy paper that you can use in your everyday life. And the other interesting point is that uh, we can actually control the orientation of the fibers in the paper uh, with this uh, pell scale process, which is actually impossible to do uh, when you have a batch filtration process. And so that's what we can see here in this uh, 2D uh, X-ray diffraction. Uh, we can see that for uh, the pell scale process, we have a preferred orientation, but uh, when we are doing a regular hand sheet with a, a batch scale um, or bench scale uh, filtration system, there are no preferred orientation or just randomly oriented fibers in the paper. And then the way that we're going to uh, measure the resistive uh, liquid sensing are uh, based off of this equation here, which is basically a way for us to assess the sensitivity to liquid water. And so we've made more than 200 meters of paper uh, with less than 10% variations in sensitivity along the lengths and also along the width of the paper, as you, as you can see here. So... Uh, before uh, actually characterizing the uh, multifunctional liquid sensing performance, uh, I want to talk briefly about the good interfacial uh, properties between the nanotubes and the paper. So when uh, we uh, cut out uh, pieces of those uh, what we call smart paper and left them in water soaking uh, under a constant agitation for an entire day, uh, we could not measure any uh, nanotubes uh, leaching away in solution uh, using uh, absorption spectroscopy. And we only start to see a uh, signal for carbon nanotubes when we have a stronger agitation through sonication uh, for one or, or a few minutes. But when we look at the water, what we see is that, yes, nanotubes are basically being detached from the main piece of paper, but they are not uh, released alone. They are actually what is being detached is a pulp fiber that's being, you know, stretched, I mean, um, destroyed from, from the main paper, and then the nanotubes remain on the surface of that pulp fiber, and that's what is measured um, by the UV absorption spectroscopy here. Uh, and then when we do a peeling test, something similar happens. Um, so a tape uh, is uh, peeled off of the surface of our, our nanotube paper, and then after the first peeling cycle, we have only a negligible change in electrical resistance, which barely increased by less than 2% uh, after the first um, peeling of the tape. And then when we look closely at the tape, we can see that we're not peeling just the nanotubes, we're actually peeling the pulp fibers uh, with carbon nanotubes on their surface really well attached. So that's, again, a, a, another a demonstration of the very good and strong interfacial characterization, uh, interfacial properties uh, in, in this material. So now, um, the water sensing mechanism, like I said before, is actually based on uh, the swelling of cellulose. But here, the main idea is that we actually have a hierarchical swelling, because that swelling happened at two different scales. It happens for the larger pulp fibers, 
right? And this is what is shown in this picture here. Uh, but it also happens at a smaller scale with the nanocellulose because they have the same chemistry, the same composition, so the nanocellulose will also swell. And so this hierarchical swelling allows to have a very high sensitivity. And so basically what happens is that we can see here, this is a pulp fiber, and if you imagine this pulp fiber being coated with uh, carbon nanotubes on the surface, as this pulp fiber, uh, pulp fiber is swelling, the electrical path between the nanotubes is going to be disrupted. And then the beauty is that this is actually reversible, and when you dry the material, um, the uh, uh, cellulose will shrink, um, both the nanocellulose and the pulp fibers will shrink, and you'll be reforming those electrical connections. And so this is allowing us to do a very fast and very sensitive uh, water sensing system. As you can see here, the uh, very moment the paper is immersed in water, um, it works as a basically a, a switch, and so that LED is turned off. And now when we are drying uh, the paper, I'll, I'll speed up a little bit. You can see that the light is uh, slowly turning back on. And so we are recovering this electrical uh, connectivity in the material. And so this uh, kind of a reversible uh, sensing mechanism is uh, very reliable over multiple cycles, as you can see here. Uh, more than 30 cycles have been tested. And then also uh, it does not really be impacted by aging. And we've been testing the materials over a period of six months without any significant changes in sensitivity. So now, about the uh, water sensing performance itself. So it is one of the highest reported sensitivity in the literature. Um, and this allows us uh, here on the uh, first graph on the top left corner to actually detect and quantify very small volumes of water, as low as sub microliter volumes of water, very precisely. Uh, and then um, we can, of course, all of those uh, tests were done in deionized water, but uh, we can do a similar testing in tap water, as you can see here. And we can also spike um, DI water or tap water with uh, different types of salts. And we can actually use the sensor to measure accurately the salt concentrations uh, in both DI water and, and tap water. And then the response rate is really fast. And so to sort of exemplify how fast the response of the sensor is, uh, we've actually uh, implemented a wave monitoring system here where we had our uh, U-shaped sensor, paper sensor, immersed uh, in water. Um, and then uh, we used an orbital shaker to actually create waves. And so by changing the uh, rotation speed of the shaker, uh, we'll be basically changing the frequency of those waves and we're able to very fastly, uh, rapidly actually assess and monitor the change in the wave frequency, as you can see here. And then finally, uh, this uh, sensor, uh, the sensitivity is that high that we can not only measure liquid water, but we can also measure moisture. And so this is an example where we were comparing our uh, paper-based sensor here uh, with a regular moisture sensor uh, commercially available in the market. So now uh, for practical applications and practical testing, uh, we developed uh, a um, Internet of Things uh, leak monitoring system, uh, which basically uh, is composed of our paper that's wrapped around the pipe or uh, placed around uh, the area that you want to detect, uh, the sensitive area where you think there is a leak. It's connected uh, through an Arduino system um, to, uh, through this chip uh, to uh, a visual uh, notification system and a wireless uh, text notification and that can tell you uh, where you have a leak occurring. So now this system has been implemented um, in uh, at the CERN uh, LHC and so the particle accelerator you know located at the boundary between France and Swiss and uh, they were testing our system underground um, to see if they were actually able to detect leaks uh, when there are like a strong you know, swings in temperature and humidity happening. And so the testing was done using their cooling water uh, system, which is, as you can see, uh, fairly dirty. So it's even worse than the, the tap water or other things in there. Uh, and then the paper was wrapped around uh, one of the pipes 
And to simulate the leak, um, they basically uh, drop casted uh, 0.25 mils of water on the surface of the paper, right? And uh, uh, they, they left the paper there for a, 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 about a weekend. And so as you can see here, despite the changes in temperature and humidity, uh, the uh, system was able to uh, accurately detect a leak and then recover very fast uh, its initial um, its initial resistance or its initial electrical uh, properties um, to monitor uh, a second link a second leak if that were to occur. So this system is extremely versatile because it could be used on flat surfaces, but also it could be used to wrap up any sorts of uh, systems and, and devices. Um, and then it could be placed on substrate that are either insulating or electrically conductive, and it would still work. As you can see here, uh, we have performed some testing on copper pipes. And then even more impressive is that is the fact that we can actually cut the paper into any sorts of geometry to accommodate any sorts of uh, leak monitoring uh, systems um, that uh, is needed. Uh, and so when you cut the material, uh, you can also patch it back using, uh, let's say, an aluminum tape or copper tape, and uh, you will get actually uh, statistically similar performance between one uh, piece of paper and then two pieces of paper that were patched together using a tape. So this makes for a very versatile uh, liquid sensing system. And then lastly, uh, we wanted to see if we were able to actually quantify um, some of the water that was lost through leaks. And so for that, we created a fairly simple uh, model based off of the equivalent resistance of our paper, which was represented as a matrix of resistive cells, as you can see here. So in this matrix, we'll have the unit resistance uh, for the wet area of the paper, denoted here, and then the uh, unit resistance for the dry area of the paper. And then we can simply calculate the uh, equivalent resistance of the whole material, and then we can do so for the wet stage and the dry stage and calculate the sensitivity. And so to estimate the uh, relative wet area, we used an image analysis uh, here, and so those were the sizes of the paper that were used, um, and then we drop casted different volumes of water on it. And then using image analysis, we're able to actually, you know, um, assess the uh, relative wet area. And that were used to feed our model. And we had very good, um, a very good correlation between the experimental results and the simulations. So with that, I'll conclude uh, this presentation. And I want to acknowledge my group members uh, for uh, providing the data for this research, along with my uh, international collaborators for all of my different projects. And I also want to mention uh, the funding institutions that were able to make this research happen. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any question, feel free to send them to my email address. Thank you. Have a, have a good rest of your day.